B. We call to order the case of United States v. Carabasset. Are both parties present and ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. All right, any pretrial matters before we start? Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor, the Constitution has a few pretrial matters that we were going to do. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, I apologize. I apologize. Your Honor, we would ask first that both parties be allowed to state their appearances before we get into preliminary matters. Absolutely. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Tali Vukatic, representing the government. Assisting me throughout today's trial will be my second chair, Ms. Gabby Grosso, and although you won't be able to see or hear her, she'll be assisting me with the technology in today's proceedings. Good afternoon. Appearances from the defense? Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Akia Morris, and I represent Ms. Bassett in today's case. My second chair is Ayane Alvarado-Jones, who will also be assisting me in the exhibits. Good afternoon. Any preliminary matters before opening statements? Yes, Your Honor. The government has a couple preliminary matters before we get going. First, we'd like to invoke Rule 615 and ask that all parties be constructively sequestered at this time. So invoked. Defense counsel, do you have a party representative? Yes, we do. Our party representative is Kara Bassett. Do you have any objection to that? No, Your Honor. All right, so moved. Similarly, we ask that all witnesses be constructively, uh, constructively sworn in at this time. So moved. Similarly, we would ask to turn the court's attention to evidentiary ruling number seven, which states that exhibits four through 33 have been pre-admitted into evidence and will be used throughout today's trial. Ms. Morris, is that your understanding of the pretrial order? Yes, it is, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Finally, we would ask your preference as to sharing our screen, if you would like us to ask prior to sharing or if we can simply do so. You can go ahead and feel free uh, to share your screen whenever you see uh, both to be fit and admissible. If either party has any objections to publishing evidence to the jury or if you'd like to constructively uh, have it outside the view of the jury, just note that for the court. Um, but no, uh, feel free to share with, without seeking permission each time you do. Yes, Your Honor. With that, the government's ready to proceed. All right. Anything before we start from defense counsel? No, Your Honor. The defense is ready to proceed as well. All right. Then we're going to begin with opening statements from the government. And I'll remind the judges once again to change to speaker view at this time. Whenever you're ready to proceed. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. She needed control, so she took it. August 18th, 2017. It's a normal day for Don Clark. He's going about his daily business at the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park, which he owns. He finishes up his work and he heads back home. Waiting there for him is his wife, the defendant with an elephant tranquilizer ready to kill. As soon as he gets home, she stabs him with that tranquilizer and kills him on sight. And in that moment, she finally got the one thing she'd always wanted. Control. Good afternoon, members of the jury. Ali Vukatic on behalf of the government. Now we are charging the defendant, Kara Bassett, with first degree murder. This means that the defendant killed another human being, Don Clark, with malice aforethought. More simply, the defendant purposefully made the decision to murder Don Clark. And throughout the course of today's trial, it will become abundantly clear that's exactly what happened. Now we will call Special Agent Steph Branham. He will detail the steps in his investigation using exhibits and a timeline. He will outline in detail how the defendant murdered John Clark with an elephant tranquilizer on the night of August 18th. How the defendant used a company wheelchair to transport his body into the company van. How the defendant drove 
her husband 200 miles to the Big Gum Swamp and left his body there. Then the defendant drove back to Tallahassee to make it seem like an accident? But the facts in today's case will tell you this was no accident. The defendant needed control, so she took it. Mr. Clark was a businessman. He owned an elephant park. But what you'll hear today is that as much as the defendant wished she had control, she had no say in how the park was run. You'll hear through her own words today how much this upset her. You'll learn that Mr. Clark had $8 million in assets, multiple homes, a plane, and most importantly, how Mr. Clark controlled the defendant's finances. You'll learn that Mr. Clark controlled everything. And the defendant controlled nothing. Members of the jury, this is a clear cut case. The evidence overwhelmingly points to one person and one person alone, the defendant. She had no control of her husband, she had no control of her money, and she had no control of her elephant park. She decided enough was enough. She killed for control. Members of the jury, at the end of today's trial, I will stand before you and ask you to find the defendant guilty of murder. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Opening statements from the defense? Yes, your honor. And Ms. Vukatic, if you could uh, mute yourself before she begins. Thank you. May it please the court. Unreliable, unreasonable, uncertain. Members of the jury, those three words describe exactly what this case is about. Now, Ms. Volkatich just stood before you and told you a very compelling story about what she believes happened to Don Clark. But she left out key details of the unreliable investigation conducted by the FBI. An unreasonable case built by the government and uncertain evidence that a murder even took place. Members of the jury, the prosecution has charged my client with the murder for former husband, Don Clark. Now, since they did that, they have the burden of proof. They must prove to you that my client killed her husband beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, this case is filled with doubt, members of the jury, and they will fail to meet their burden because of those three words that I just mentioned to you just a moment ago unreliable, unreasonable, uncertain. First, unreliable. You will hear from our direct examination of Joe Young how the FBI mishandled key evidence. You will also hear how the FBI failed to question any of the park's employees. And you will hear how Joe Young, a famous TV producer, had recorded over two thousand hours worth of footage of Don Clark and Kara Bassett, yet the FBI thought, didn't even bother to look at any of it. Throughout the duration of the trial, you'll also hear about the lack of evidence that the prosecution even has. They have no dead body, no murder weapon, no signs of blood, and no signs of foul play. The prosecution won't even be able to give you DNA evidence or phone call records that places my client at the scene of the crime because there are none. Second, let's talk about the unreasonable case that the prosecution will provide you. Now, the prosecution is going to try to tell you that my client killed her husband in order to turn an elephant park into an elephant sanctuary. But members of the jury, we will show you how there's too much evidence that supports otherwise. We will give you evidence that puts doubt that entire narrative. You will hear Joe Young attest to how devastated Carabasset was after losing her husband. 
You will hear from the cross-examination of the prosecution's Agent Branham about how cooperative Kara Bassett was throughout their entire investigation. She cooperated fully, and you will hear how the same cannot be said for many other witnesses. Third and most important, uncertain. The prosecution can't even be certain that Don Clark was murdered. There's too much evidence that supports other theories. We will show you evidence that Don Clark was being chased by his ex-wife, Lisa Clark, in the days leading to his disappearance. You will also hear how Mr. Clark had even fantasized about disappearing one day. We will also tell you about a trip that Joe Young took to Costa Rica that shows evidence that Don Clark may be there, still living to this day. Members of the jury, you, at the end of this trial, once all of the evidence has been laid out in front of you, we are confident that you will understand the unreliability of the FBI's investigation, the unreasonableness of the case that the government has built against my clients, and the uncertainty that Don Clark was even murdered. At the end of this trial, I'm going to stand before you one last time and ask you to render a fair and just verdict of not guilty against my client's care of asset. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. I'm going to remind the judges to switch back over to gallery view now and allow the government to open their case in chief. Ms. Vukatish, do you have any witnesses? Yes, Your Honor, at this time, the government calls Special Agent Steph Branham. Ms. Branham, you've been constructively sworn. May I proceed, Your Honor? Good afternoon, Agent Branham. Can you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Branham, Senior Special Agent of the FBI. And can you tell us about your qualifications? Yes, ma'am. In 1982, I graduated from the University of Cincinnati with a degree in psychology. Since 2002, I've been a special agent of the FBI, and I was promoted to senior special agent in 2012. Agent Brenham, how are you involved in today's case? I was the lead investigator into the disappearance of Don Clark. And as part of your investigation, did you arrest anyone? Yes. After our investigation turned to a murder investigation, I arrested Kara Bassett, the defendant, for the murder of Don Clark. Now, Agent Branham, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I actually created a timeline based on the GPS records, physical evidence, and information I gathered from personal interviews. Now, Agent Branham, Ms. Grosso was sharing her screen. Let's start with the first time that you noted. What was that? 8 p.m. This is when the last of the park employees had left and only Don Clark and the defendant were alone at their home. And how do you know that they were alone? Phone records indicate that they were both together at their elephant park until 11.14 p.m. Now, was there evidence of any break-ins at the Clark residence? No, ma'am. We found no evidence of a break-in, no signs of violence at the park. So at 11.14, what happened? We lost the cell signal from Don Clark's phone. And how does this happen? This can happen if the SIM card is destroyed or if the phone is turned airplane mode. Now what was the next time that you noted? 11.17 p.m. What happened at 11.17? GPS records indicate that Don Clark's van left the residence and drove 130 miles, 139 miles due east to the Big Gum Swamp. And what time did it get there? 1.26 a.m. About how long was the van there before it left? GPS records indicate 44 minutes until 2.10 a.m. Now, at 2.10 a.m., when the van left, do you know where it went? Yes, it, it drove 132 miles west, back toward the direction of the residence, but ended up at an airport in uh, five miles away from the residence. Now, why was this airport significant? This is where we found the van. We, uh, when during our search, 
we found this white Chevy van at the airport and the defendant told us this was Don Clark's van. Now, when you and your team searched the van, did you collect any physical evidence? Yes, uh, we discovered <clears throat> hair in the back seat, fingerprints all over the van, and algae on the gas pedals of the van. Now, turning your attention to what Ms. Grosso was showing, do you know what this is? Yes, this is the forensics report to determine the physical evidence in this case. Your Honor, I'd like to note that Exhibit 5 has already been entered into evidence. Now, Agent Brenham, did you come to any conclusions about the hair that you mentioned? Yes, ma'am. Forensics indicated that the six hairs we found in the white Chevy van on the floor in the back seat are more than a one in two billion match to Don Clark's DNA. Now, what about the fingerprints that you mentioned? Do you know who those belong to? Yes, we found 28 fingerprints, and the most notable person that these matched to was the defendant, Kara Bassett. Now, you mentioned algae samples. Did you compare those algae samples? Yes, ma'am. We found algae and the floor on the gas pedal of the van, as well as a wheelchair found at the residence. Both of these algae combinations were also found at the Big Gum Swamp, confirmed by forensics. Now, Agent Branham, did you compare any other samples of algae to the algae found at the swamp? Yes, we also compared boots we found at the residence that the defendant told us were hers. They had mud on the soles that were a direct match to the Big Gum Swamp. Now I'd like to talk some more about the evidence that you collected at the Elephant Park. Do you recognize what Ms. Grosso is now showing you? Yes, this is a syringe we found in a storage unit at the park. You know what was in the syringe? Yes, we discovered that the syringe had a dangerous chemical known as carfentanil. It was used as an elephant tranquilizer. Now, do you recognize this safety sheet that Ms. Grosso was showing you? Yes, this is the material safety data sheet of carfentanil. Did you note any of the side effects as part of your investigation? Yes, we found that carfentanil is fatal to human contact. We discovered that it was 5,000 more times toxic than heroin. And as part of your investigation, do you know who had access to this carfentanil? We discovered that some of the employees had access to this, but most notably the defendant, Kara Bassett, did. And did you ever ask her about this carfentanil? Yes, as a matter of fact, we did. And she told us that that syringe was, it didn't, you didn't need to use the whole syringe in order to kill somebody. Now, did anything about the defendant's relationship with the victim make her a suspect? Yes, ma'am. We discovered that they were married and lived together at the park, but we also discovered a restraining order that Don Clark filed against the defendant for domestic violence. Now, Agent Branham, I'm gonna ask you to turn in your digital notebook to Exhibit 34. Do you recognize this? Uh, yes, ma'am. This is the restraining order that Don Clark filed against the defendant. Is it fair and accurate from the last time that you saw it? Uh, yes, it is. Your Honor, at this time, the government moves to enter Exhibit 34 into evidence. Any objections? Yes, Your Honor, the defense objects to hearsay to this document. Response. Your Honor, regarding the written portions of the document, this falls under public record. The trustworthiness of the typed portions are not in question. Regarding Mr. Clark's statements, this falls under the exception 804B6. This is a statement offered against a party who wrongfully caused the defendant the declarant's unavailability to testify. Excuse me. Your Honor, if I may uh, say uh, my piece. Please, do, if you have a response based on the 804B6 argument. Uh, Your Honor, to the, uh, excuse me, so opposing counsel's response of saying that this document is a public record, this restraining order is not a public record. Counsel? Your Honor, could you just give me one moment? And I would ask that um, opposing counsel provide me the number so that I can reference it. The, the number of what, counsel? 
the number of public record is 803.8. Yes, public records exception is 8038, Council. Your Honor, this falls under 8038B because neither the source of the information nor the circumstances lack trustworthiness. We know this is a document that was made in the course of law proceedings. It was a civil case filed by Mr. Clark. We know that the trustworthiness of the typed portions is not in question. Well, counsel, you said it falls under 8038B. Is the exception under Rule 8038, uh, is that a conjunctive or a disjunctive test? Does it have to meet all or just one of those qualifications? Your Honor, it just has to meet one. Is that your understanding of the rule, Ms. Morris? No, Your Honor, to my understanding, it has to meet all criteria of a public record to be labeled as a public record. I believe that's correct. Counsel, do you have any response to the remaining elements that you have to meet to allow a document to be under the 8038 exception? Your Honor, I stand by my response that this falls under a public record as the document itself was made within normal course of legal proceedings and it was used for not just Mr. Clark's proceedings but multiple restraining order proceedings throughout the course of a normal legal day. All right so I don't think I, th I don't think we're going to get the entire document in under 8038. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have the foundation laid to show that it actually does meet those qualifications but so we've dismissed that argument you have one more argument you said 804 b6 the statements of the victim are against someone who has wrongfully caused their unavailability as a witness. Do you have a response to that, Defense Counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, declared unavailable only applies to if the defendant was the cause of the uh, declarant's unavailability. That is why we are here in court today. And there is no, uh, there is no uh, objection or exception in the uh, Matra rules that allows uh, redactation of certain documents. The entire document has to be in, and I previously just objected to it. Right. I mean, that's my understanding as well, but I'm saying the court would receive the remainder of those statements as not being for the truth of the matter asserted, because they are just legal headings, and they are questions, and they are categories that are filled in with actual statements that, to my understanding, counsel is being used uh, for the truth of the matter asserted. So you said that's why we're here today. Um, Last word, government counsel, are you trying to constructively admit this and say that throughout the course of today's trial, you're going to be able to show by a preponderance that evidentiary standard that she did wrongfully cause his unavailability? Yes, Your Honor. I'd like to note that it, the bar for admissibility simply means that it makes a fact more or less likely, and it's sufficient to support a finding. That's what we're doing here. The yeah. Yes, counsel. It's, I understand the, the bar for Rule 401, and your argument for Rule 804b6 is, is well received. I think what we're going to do is we'll constructively admit it, and then if you have the defense counsel, Ms. Morris, if you have a problem with this document being in the record, by the time we get to closing arguments, if you don't think they've met that evidentiary standard, which is by preponderance of the evidence to prove that she caused the unavailability, then re-raise the objection, and we'll hear it then, and we'll be able to show you know, what evidence actually does support that proposition. So for now, it'll be constructively admitted. If you don't think they've met that burden by the end of the trial, re-raise your objection. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Agent Branham, Ms. Grosso is showing you Exhibit 34. I'm gonna turn your attention to a portion on the right page. Do you recognize this? Yes, ma'am, this is Don Clark's handwriting confirmed uh, by witnesses. Now, can you read to us what Mr. Clark says? Yes, it says, this is the- Objection, Your Honor. Lack yes. of foundation. As, as to what? Your Honor, the, there has been no uh, foundation to the handwriting or who it was written by. Uh, yes, I, I tend to agree, Counsel. We heard that it was confirmed through witnesses that this is his handwriting. Um, I'm, I'm going to need some more foundation to, yeah. to know who these witnesses are and how they were able to confirm this handwriting. So it's sustained. Proceed. Now, Agent Branham, how do you know whose handwriting this is? Well, Don Clark's attorney told me through a letter that this was the restraining order that he filed against Kara Bassett and that this is his writing. Now, can you read to us what it says? Yes, it says... This is the second time Kara has gotten angry enough to threaten to kill me. She said, let me run the park my way or I'm gonna kill you. She told me to leave my own property. I own that property. 
I can't defend myself because she took my uh, 30, uh, 357 revolver and hit it. I'm afraid she's going to kill me in my sleep. Now, Agent Branham, did Mr. Clark's attorney provide you with any other documents pointing you to the defendant as a suspect? Yes, ma'am. They pointed us to a power of attorney document that was filed less than two months before Don Clark disappeared. In it, the language of the power of attorney document states that the defendant would gain control over all of his assets should he die or simply disappear. Now, according to this document, what would the defendant control if Mr. Clark disappeared? She would have control over all of his assets cars, businesses, houses, investments. By the defendant's own admission, she told us that these were worth $8 million. Thank you, Agent Branham. I have nothing further. Cross-examination, counsel. Uh, yes, Your Honor, if you allow me to readjust my camera. May I proceed? Yes. Good afternoon, Agent Branham. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin my examination by discussing your investigation. Now, once you were informed that Don Park uh, was missing, you searched the entirety of the Elephant Park, didn't you? That's correct. We searched the entire park and its surrounding areas. And you found no signs of blood? Yes, at the park, there were no signs of blood or violence that our team found. There were no signs of foul play either. Isn't that right? Well, no, ma'am. We did find a missing syringe at the premises. Agent Branham, that's not what I asked. I asked if there were any signs of foul play, and you couldn't conclude any, could you? From the first search, no, ma'am. We couldn't. Now, you even searched the Elephant Park security footage, didn't you? That's right. And you found nothing of significance there as well? Yes, when we checked the security footage, there was nothing unusual about it. You also looked at Mr. Clark's phone records? Uh, Ms. Adderall Jones, could you please display Exhibit 21? Now, the first highlighted text in this phone record says that it was sent at 2.32 of the day Mr. Clark went missing. Isn't that right? Yes, that's correct. And as you can see in this, it says that Mr. Clark texted my client that he wanted to talk to her about a trip to Costa Rica, correct? Yes, ma'am, that's what it says. Now the next highlighted series of texts is from an unknown number from Costa Rica, correct? Yes, an unlisted number. And that was sent at 6 p.m. of the day Mr. Clark disappeared? Uh, yes, it was. And these two text messages say, call me in Spanish, don't they? Uh, to my understanding, that's correct. Now, Ms. Abraham Jones, could you please flip to the next page? And as you can see from this call log, Mr. Park did call this number immediately, didn't he? Uh, he made a 52-minute outgoing call at 6 p.m. to the same unlisted number in Costa Rica. And Agent Branham, you still do not know who was on the other side of that call to this day, do you? No, ma'am, it, it's an unlisted number. Ms. R.L. Jones, could you please flip to the last page one more time? Now, the last highlighted text says that Don Park texted Carabasset that he was going out for a while. Isn't that correct? Uh, it shows that his phone sent that message, yes. And it was sent at 11.14 p.m. of the day that he disappeared? That's correct. Ms. Abraham Jones, you can tape out the screen now. I'd like to talk to you about some of the ways that you formed your conclusions now to switch gears. Now, you said that you found algae on my client's boots, isn't that correct? Uh, not only on the defendant's boots, but yes, we did find algae that was a match to the Big Gum Swamp's algae. And those samples of algae allegedly originated from Big Gum Swamp? 
Uh, yes, that's what forensics tells us. Now, this uh, now we're looking at the forensics report that you are speaking of, correct? That's right. And in the highlighted section, the forensics report concludes that algae could be transferred by contact. Isn't that right? Yes, that's a possibility. And it also said that they didn't collect any samples from the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park. Isn't that true? Uh, they never tested any samples against natural substances at the park. And that was because you didn't provide them with any samples of natural substances at the elephant park. Is that right, Andrew Branham? That's correct. Well, we didn't send natural substances. That's, we did send other samples at the park. But none from the uh, Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park's grounds? Uh, no, ma'am. We didn't test the ground itself. Now, I would like to talk to you about Big Gum Swamp once again. You sent trained dogs there with Mr. Clark's scent, isn't that right? Uh, yes, ma'am, we thought he might have been there. And the dogs came back and you figured that there was no scent of Mr. Clark's there at the swamp. Objection, Your Honor, compound question. Response. Your Honor, I did not ask one question. I simply was asking the witness if the dogs were able to find Mr. Clark sent there. Counsel for the government, could, could you repeat what exactly the question is that you're objecting to? Yes, Your Honor, opposing counsel said the dogs came back and then proceeded to ask another question. I would just ask that she split those up, asking if the dogs returned and then asking about their conclusions. Okay, um, defense counsel, can, can this question, the call of this question, be, be answered with, with one response? Yes, it can be. All right, then, then I'm gonna overrule the objection, and, uh, and if, the, if the witness wants to disagree with one part of that question, he can disagree with all of it. All right, so over, overrule. Agent Branham, when the dogs came back, you figured that there was no scent of Mr. Parks at Big Gum Swamp, isn't that right? Uh, no, ma'am, just that the dogs couldn't find him. Now, I would like to talk to you about some of your interactions with my client and how you formed your case against her. Now, you talked to Ms. Bassett over a dozen times, is that right? That's correct. And during this time, she fully cooperated? Uh, yes, she agreed to all the interviews I had set up. In fact, she's the one that told your team where Don Park Cessna airplane was, is that right? Yes, she told us about the van at the airport as well as the plane at the airport. So, yes, she told you about where his Cessna airplane was and his Chevrolet Express van? That's correct. But the same cooperativeness cannot be said for Don Clark's ex-wife, Lisa Clark, can it? Uh, that's correct, ma'am. She, uh, she disagreed to me setting up an interview with her. In fact, when you walked to Lisa Clark's footstep, I mean, excuse me, doorstep, and asked her if she would cooperate, she flat out refused. That, uh, objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation that Agent Branham went to go see Lisa Clark. Response? Outlay the proper foundation, Your Honor. Uh, no, that's, that's fine, actually. Um, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to ask additional questions, you can, but this is cross-examination. If the witness wants to disagree with something, they can. Uh, you you feel, don't feel the need to, to lay foundation, but sure, uh, move on. Yes, Your Honor. Now, you went to Lisa Clark's home, correct? That's correct. And you asked her to cooperate with the investigation? Uh, yes, but she denied cooperating. And now I would like to talk to you, finally, about what you know of Mr. Clark. Now, you were there during an interview that you and your colleague, that you and your colleague had with Ms. Bassett. Is that right? That's correct. So you are aware that Mr. Clark was involved with the Costa Rican Mafia? Uh, Ma'am, that's what the defendant told us. We never confirmed if that was true. Uh, there's no evidence to indicate that he was. So Kara Bassett told you that Mr. Clark was involved with the Costa Rican Mafia. Is not that right? Yes, that's what she told us. Now, you also reviewed a letter from Manny Timonelli. Is that correct? Yes, Don Clark's attorney. Ms. Arrow Jones, could you please display Exhibit 4? Now, this is that letter from Manny Sonner. I would right. note that. Yep. Uh, th thank you very much, counsel. Um, 
Yes, time has expired. Um, do we have anything in the way of uh, redirect examination for Agent Branham? Nothing in the way, Your Honor. I would just ask for a time check from my second before proceeding. Sure. All right, 25 seconds. Do you, uh, do you want to use any or all of that? Yes, Your Honor, I would. All right, let's go. Now, Agent Branham, on direct examination, opposing counsel brought up a text message sent from Mr. Clark's phone. Do you have any way of knowing if Mr. Clark was the one that sent this message? No, ma'am. The records only indicate that it was sent from his phone. Now, how big was the Big Gum Swamp? It was several thousand acres, and at night it, it was dark. It, it was unsafe, to be honest. Thank you. I have nothing further. Your Honor, may this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you, Agent Branham. You can, uh, you may be excused. And counsel for the government, do you have any further witnesses? No, Your Honor. However, I'd like to ask that pursuant to ju pursuant to Rule 201, we would ask that the court take judicial notice that the swamp was 13,000 acres and just that the mileage of that is 20 square miles. Do you have any objection to that, counsel? No, Your Honor. All right, so uh, the, the court will take judicial notice and instruct the jury as if it were a stipulated fact as to uh, those exact numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the government rests. All right. If the government has rested their case in chief. Defense counsel, do you wish to present a case? Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Joe Young to the witness stand. All right, Ms. Young, you've been constructively sworn in whenever you're ready to proceed. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Young, may you please introduce yourself to the court? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Joe Young. Excuse me, the uh, connection went out. I wasn't able to hear what she had said. Ms. Young, could you please reintroduce yourself to the court? Yes, uh, my name is sure. Joe Young. Now, what is your involvement with this case, Ms. Young? Well, I'm actually the television producer for Kara Bassett's documentary titled Elephant Queen. Now, how did you come to film this documentary? Well, Kara Bassett contacted me in 2015 and she told me about her elephant park and she wanted me to film. I mean, when I went to the park and I looked, this wasn't your typical keeping up with the Kardashians. So I thought this would be something great to film and really make a nice documentary about her work in the zoo. What did you film in this documentary? Um, so I would film Kara Bassett. I would film her interactions with the elephants, her staff, and also her husband, Don Clark. And how much footage at the elephant park did you film? Um, I have up to 2,000 hours of footage. And how much of that footage were you made to turn over to the FBI? Oh, none of it. The FBI never asked for any of the footage. Now I'd like to talk to you about the FBI's investigation. Now, were you there when the FBI began their investigation? Yes, so when I arrived back from my trip to Mexico on August 25th, um, I saw the FBI was at the park investigating. And when you arrived, did you stop filming? Oh no, Miss Bassett asked me specifically to continue to film to be sure that the FBI did everything they were supposed to do. So I filmed their search of the park. Did you film the FBI doing anything that they weren't supposed to do? Yes, now I'm- There's no lack of foundation as to how this witness would know what the FBI is supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. Response. Your Honor, I'll rephrase the question. I was trying to ask the witness if they filmed anything wrong or peculiar with the FBI's investigation. All right, well then we'll move on and if we have any objections to the rephrase question, feel free to raise them. Now, Ms. Young, did you find anything strange with the FBI's investigation? Yes. Objection, Your Honor, relevance as to this witness's perception of strange and why that would matter at the case of bar. All right, response to the relevance objection. 
Your Honor, this witness would have this witness's uh, testimony on the FBI's investigation would be relevant because it shows whether or not the FBI's investigation was reliable. We're using it to prove that in today's case. Last word. Yes, Your Honor. Although the testimony of what she witnessed of the investigation may be relevant, what the witness deemed as weird or unusual is not relevant. All right. I think that may go to a matter of weight. Relevance is a low bar. So on those grounds, I'll overrule. You yes, Ron. Do you need me to react to the question? Um, no, I think I got it. So when I was recording, I'm no investigator, but when I was recording, I noticed that when the FBI, one of the agents was handling the elephant tranquilizers, um, they weren't using any gloves. Which Object to your honor character. Your Honor, can I ask why the uh, opposing counsel is objecting to character evidence? I think I may need a little more explanation here, too. Yes, of course, Your Honor. Opposing counsel is trying to use this singular instance of the FBI not wearing gloves to show that the entire FBI investigation was incomplete. That's improper character evidence. All right, so the, they're, you're saying they're using this past specific instance to show a conformity in the future. When would be the conformity? The conformity, it's the defense's contention that the entire FBI investigation was incomplete and they're using this to show that um, in this singular instance, they mishandled evidence. So obviously that means there was a continuation of that throughout the entire investigation. So just uh, one more question to clarify your objection before I, I send it to Ms. Morris. Is your objection to the, the character of the FBI as a whole or just this one agent who was collecting this evidence? Your Honor, it's my understanding that this witness cannot singularly identify this witness, so we're going to use it to show the entire FBI. All right. Do you have any response, Ms. Morris? Your Honor, we are not using this evidence to prove a character of a singular witness or the FBI as a whole. We're using it to show how unreliable the FBI's investigation was. Yeah, and I think that's how the jury will take it, but Ms. Vukatich, you make an interesting point, and I, I see how the jury could misinterpret that evidence to be taken that way, so I will give a limiting instruction to that effect, but we'll proceed and it'll be overruled. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Young, can you please finish your answer? Yeah, so when I was recording the FBI's investigation, I saw that there was one of the agents handling the elephant tranquilizers with no gloves on, so I made sure I caught that on camera. Do you know of any other evidence that the FBI collected? Um, yes, I also saw them collecting Kara Bassett's boots that she wore on the, um, part in, the in the park. Ms. Arrow Jones, could you please display Exhibit 29? We'll just move on from there. Um, now, do you know what the uh, defendant's boots looks like? Yes, um, she wore them every day when I was filming. She had them when she would go tend to the elephants, walk around the park, so I saw them all the time. Now I'd like to talk to you about Don Clark and Kara Bassett. Now, did you know Kara Bassett well? Yeah, I was with her five days a week for two years. Yeah, I knew her very well. And did you know Don Clark? Yes. How would you describe Don and Kara's relationship? Well, from what I observed, they were very affectionate, very loving, um, ve just very affectionate. You know, they'd fight here and there like any other couple, but they just seemed like they really cared for each other. And they had a very interesting bond over their love for elephants, which I made sure I captured. Now I'd like to talk to you about Don Clark's disappearance. Now, did you talk to Kara Bassett and Don Clark that day? Yes, I talked to both of them throughout the day. It was a regular day of filming, so we had a few conversations. And how was Kara Bassett that day? I mean, she was acting as she did most of the time, you know, just helping out the elephants, walking around the park, we did some filming, nothing out of the ordinary. Now, you mentioned you talked to Don Clark earlier that day. Can you describe that interaction? Yes, so around 6 p.m. before I left the park, Don and I were having a conversation about the trip I was about to take to Mexico, 
And during that conversation, Don looked at his phone and his face turned completely white. All expression dropped. It looked like he had seen a ghost. After that, he just said, I need to deal with this. And it's awesome. Your Honor, this falls under hearsay exception 803.2, excited utterance, which means that any statement said by a declaring under a startling event is not hearsay. And as you heard from Ms. Young's testimony, uh, Don Clark seemed very startled when he made this, uh, when he made this statement, excuse me. All right, response. Your Honor, although that's what she perceived, we have no idea what Mr. Clark was feeling, what he was, what was going on at the time. His reaction could have been to a number of things, so we cannot use the excited utterance exception. Do you have any response on those grounds, Ms. Morris? Yes, Your Honor, we can use the excited utterance exception because it is the witness's perception that he was startled when he made this exclamation. Yeah, I think if we had to go beyond just the witness's perception to be able to meet that qualification under 8032, we might have a problem ever using that rule. So I, I will overrule the objection. Um, and that sounds like a, a great matter for cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Now, can you please finish your answer? Yes, so after looking at his phone, you know, he turned white, looked extremely distraught, and then he told me I have to deal with this and that was the end of the conversation. That was the last time I ever saw him. Now, Miss Young, I'd like to talk to you about Don Clark's ex-wife, Lisa Clark. Do you know who that is? Yes, I know Lisa Clark. She would often come to the park while we were filming and stir up a ruckus. There was even one time I was there when she came yelling and told Don Clark that- That's your honor hearsay. Thoughts? Your Honor, again, I would use the hearsay exception 803.2. During this time, Lisa Clark was having an argument with Don Clark, and an argument can be labeled as a startled event, a startling event. Okay. Response? Because she was yelling, excuse me. Got it. Your Honor, the foundation hasn't been laid that they were in an argument. Ms. Young simply said that she came to the park and was yelling. Yeah, that's my understanding of the record as well. So uh, until we have a little more foundation there, I'm going to sustain the objection. Yes, Your Honor. Can I lay that foundation? We'll see. Now, Ms. Young, why did Lisa Clark explain this? Objection, Your Honor, speculation as to why she did anything. Sustained. Now, Ms. Young, what was the situation that was occurring uh, to make Lisa Clark explain this? Well, Lisa Clark, she came to the park and you know, she was yelling. She seemed almost furious, face red, and Don Clark tried to remain calm, you know, and deal with her. She often had these outbursts when she would come to the park. And that's her character. Could you explain your grounds a little more? Yes, Your Honor. Opposing counsel is trying to use this instance of Ms. Clark's outbursts and yelling at Mr. Clark to show that she acted with continuity on another instance. All right, response on those grounds. Your Honor, according to, uh, excuse me, character evidence exception 405A, methods of proving character by specific instance of conduct, when a person's character or trait is a, um, excuse me, essential element in a charge, claim, or defense, then it is allowed. It is proper character evidence. So it's, it's, your, it's your position that 405A allows the admission of this evidence? Excuse me, 405B. 405B. Okay, so to my understanding of the rules of evidence, Rule 405 is uh, an explanation of the manner in which you can present already admissible character evidence, if admissible, under another rule. And you cited the pertinent trait rule, so 404A2A. Counsel, do you have a response on those grounds? Your Honor, a response to my response or opposing counsel, excuse me. Your response, government, uh, to, to her position that this falls under 404A2A, that it's a pertinent trait. Your Honor, she's not 4042A specifically specifically pertains to the defendant or the victim in a criminal case. And Lisa Clark is neither the victim nor the defendant in today's case. You're right. So Ms. Morris, Your do you Honor, have any other uh, any other exception to the character evidence rule? Yes, Your Honor. According to uh, 404B2, if a specific instance uh, shows motive, intent, or opportunity 
than it is allowed and is labeled proper character evidence. By Lisa Clark coming to the park and showing distaste for Mr. Clark often, that would give Ms. Clark motive. All right, and we'll accept it into the record under that exception with a limiting instruction to the jury to not take it for conformity therewith, but as motive evidence. Right. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Young, may you please finish your statement? Yeah, so she often came to the park and would yell at Don Clark. So in this situation, she told him that she was going to wipe him off the face of the earth. Now, uh, excuse me. Uh, now I'd like to talk to you about that documentary that you mentioned earlier. Does it cover Mr. Clark's disappearance? Oh, yes. We, I dedicated a whole episode to it, episode three, where I included the FBI's investigation. And I also included my own investigation that I did into the disappearance. Now, why did you take that invest, why did you have your own investigation into the disappearance? Excuse me. Well, I reviewed some footage that I took of one of the employees of the park, Kelsey Stebbins, which really struck me as strange. So I decided after reviewing that as to what this witness deemed strange. Is your objection on the grounds of relevance? Um, Your Honor, excuse me. I mean, um, lay witness opinion. Excuse me. The, as to what she perceived as being strange? Yes, and why that opinion is relevant in today's charge. Okay, all right, overall, you can proceed. Now, if I showed you that video of Kelsey Stebbins, would you recognize it? Yes, I would. Ms. Arrow, oh, excuse me. Your Honor, I would like to have uh, the witness view an exhibit for identification purposes. Okay, you proceed. Ms. Young, could you please go to exhibit 45 in your notebook? Yes. Now, can you identify what that video is? Yes, yeah, so this is the video that I took of Kelsey Stebbins, the employee at the Greater Tallahassee Elephant. Is it a fair and accurate copy of that video? Yes, this is the video that I took. Your Honor, the prosecution moves to have Exhibit 45 entered into evidence. Any objections? Yes, Your Honor, objection hearsay and improper character evidence. Response? Um, your Honor, can you have the opposing counsel clarify on whether or not they're objecting to character evidence or hearsay? Your Honor, I, or I'm sorry, I, uh, I am the judge here. Um, Ms. Morris, I believe the objection is to both, in fact. Yes, Your Honor. We so the objection to hearsay. Oh, yes, Your Honor. To the objection of hearsay, we are not using it for the truth of the matter, but rather the subsequent action. Ms. Young just testified that after viewing this video, she made her trip to Costa Rica. And to character evidence, we are using this, oh, excuse me, we are not using this to prove Don Clark's uh, character trait. Okay, um, I, I think to, to hearsay, we can have this in with a limiting instruction. Do you have a response on the character evidence from? Your Honor, may I respond to the hearsay objection to the opposing counsel's if, response? If you'd like. Your Honor, I believe that opposing counsel is using this for the truth of the matter. Mr. Clark's statements um, in its Excuse me, Your Honor, I should have objected double hearsay due to the fact that Mr. Clark's statements are also involved in this video. They're using not Kelsey Stebbins' statements for the truth, but they're using Mr. Clark's statements for the truth of the matter. Similarly, opposing counsel could get to Ms. Young's investigation without bringing this evidence, um, without bringing this video into evidence, excuse me. Okay, so we've got two layers of hearsay here. Wow. Wow. Why are you using the statements of Mr. Clark if not for the truth of the matter asserted, Ms. Morris? We're using it to show why Ms. Young took her trip to Costa Rica, not for the truth of the matter asserted. Okay. All right, we can have a limiting instruction there. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll allow it in um, and with a limiting instruction that it can be used for the truth of the matter asserted just to show why Ms. Young went down to Costa Rica. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I also brought up an improper char character um, objection. Okay, um, and do you have a response to that, Ms. Morris? Your Honor, we are not using this to prove the character of Don Clark nor Kelsey Sevens. We're using it to show why Ms. Clark took her trip to Costa Rica. I mean, not, okay. excuse me, Ms. Young took her trip to Costa Rica. Got it. Counsel for the government? Your Honor, by bringing this in, they're showing that Mr. Clark, um, Mr. Clark says that he wishes he could 
if I may make an offer of proof, he wishes he could disappear or sometimes run away. They're using this to show that he acted this way on one occasion, and they're using it to show that he acted the exact same way on another occasion, on another occasion, which is the defense's contention. I think that the, the statements of his beliefs, wishes, wants, desires might not necessarily fall under a, a specific action being used to prove conformity therewith. So, so I will I will let it in with a limiting instruction again to show that it's not to be able to prove that he acted in the same way uh, on the day in question. Ms. Arado Jones, could you please display Exhibit 45? One day Don came up to me and shook his head. He said, have you ever thought about just leaving it all behind? No goodbyes, no see you laters, just up and leaving in the middle of the night. Now, upon reviewing this video, what did you do, Miss Young? Well, after hearing that Kelsey Stubbins had said that Don was thinking about possibly saying he wanted to disappear, I thought about how he had business in Costa Rica. You know, oftentimes he would travel there. So I was like, well, maybe I should look into Costa Rica, travel and see if maybe he did up and disappear to Costa Rica. So I took my own trip down there to investigate. And where did you go to investigate, Ms. Young? So I went to Don Clark's home on Hermosa Beach. Now, how did you know that his home on Hermosa Beach was actually Don Clark's property? Well, Don Clark, like I said, he traveled there, I mean, almost weekly he was there. Um, that was the home where he would stay, so I traveled there. Section Your Honor, lack of foundation as to how she would know which home was Mr. Clark's. There's no foundation has been laid that she ever went with him to that house. I, I think you're right, and I'm not sure the question was sufficient to, to answer even necessarily what was asked. So, yes, if, if you could ask her how she knows that this house is the house that we say it is. Now, Ms. Young, how did you know that house in specific was Don Clark's property? Well, Don Clark had told me that that was where he was going, that- Did you honor hearsay? Awesome. Your Honor, we are, excuse me, Your Honor, we are not using this to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but how, but excuse me, why Ms. Uh, Young took her trip to uh, Costa Rica, the listener's effect. Okay, yeah, I, I think we, we've gotten that from um, Kelsey Stebbins and, and now from talking to, to him about, you know, how he used to go down to Costa Rica. Um, I, I think this is being used for the truth of the matter asserted, so I'll sustain the objection, but to my understanding, uh, based on the exhibits that have already been moved into evidence, 4 to 33, we do have sufficient foundation to say that this house is the house that it purports to be. So you can, you can proceed with asking our questions about it. Now, what did you find in Don Clark's home? Objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation that Ms. Young found in Mr. Clark's home. I, I think the answer can be nothing if she wants. I'm not sure she's assuming anything outside the record overall. Ms. Young, may you please finish? Yes, yeah, so when I went to Costa Rica, like I said, I went into the home. I had to sneak in because I didn't have the key, obviously. When I got into the house, first I noticed there wasn't a single speck of dust, like the house was wiped clean. I then went into the bedroom and found clothes in the closet. Um, and then I also noticed that there was a fan on in the house. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Cross-examination, whenever yes. you're ready. Now, Ms. Young, I'd like to talk about something you just said on direct examination. You mentioned that you went to Mr. Clark's home in Costa Rica, right? Yes, I did. And when you went there, it seemed like someone was living there. Yeah, the fan was on, there were clothes in the closet, and the house was clean. It's true there was no food in the fridge, right? I didn't find any food in the fridge. It's true there were no toiletries in the house? I didn't find any toiletries either, no. And it's true that while you spent a week there, you never saw anyone go in or out of the house? No, I never saw anyone go in and out. Now, you mentioned again on direct examination that you conducted an investigation. And you believe your investigation was complete and thorough, correct? 
Well, to the best of my ability, um, I completed some type of investigation to see if he was in Costa Rica, yes. So do you believe that your investigation was better than the FBI's? I don't, I wouldn't say better than the FBI's, but I did look into what the FBI didn't, so. Now, you're an employee of the defendant, is that right? Yes. More than that, you two are friends. Um, we do have a pretty friendly relationship, yes. She's been very generous to you? She has, yes. The defendant paid you $5,000 every month beginning in 2015 and ending in 2018, correct? Yes, she did. So this totals to about $200,000? Um, probably around that, yes. But that's not the only money you stand to make off of her, is it? That's the only money I've made off of her. That's what well, you stand to make $10 million with the sale of that documentary you were talking about, right? No, I don't. You don't? No, we have not made any money off of the documentary. I haven't sold it to anyone yet, so no. I didn't ask if you have made money or if you have that money in your account. I'm asking what you stand to make in the event that you do sell this. You stand to make a lot of money in the event that you do sell this documentary, right? Yeah, the objection, Your Honor. Grounds. The counsel is asking my witness to speculate over how much money she would make from a document that she hasn't even sold yet. I mean, excuse me, a documentary that she hasn't even sold yet. Your Honor, I didn't, the most recent question I asked, didn't ask a specific amount. I said a lot of money. She can answer no if she believes not. Similarly, this goes to bias. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I, I think the objection goes to weight, not admissibility. If she wants to say a lot, then that's fine, and then the jury can infer whatever a lot means to her. Um, but yes, if she, if she doesn't know, then she can answer that way. So overall, you can proceed. Yes, Your Honor. So, Ms. Young, one last time, with a yes or no answer. You stand to make a lot of money with the sale of that documentary, correct? If someone offers us a lot of money. Is your honor not responsive? I asked the yes or no question. I think the response, Ms. Morris, if you'd like to say something. Your honor, my witness is allowed to make a brief response before answering yes or no, so long as she does answer yes or no. Yeah, um, I, I don't think we've gotten to the point where she's, she's being non-responsive with, with her answer. Um, she can say a little more than yes or no. If, if her answer needs to be couched in that hypothetical, like it has to be, then yes, she can answer that way. So, um, Ms. Young, if you could finish your answer. Yes. Um, so, we haven't accepted an offer of any money, so I don't know how much we'll make, but based on the offers that I've gotten, um, I could stand to make a lot of money off of it, yes. Your Honor, I would ask to pause the time and just make sure that opposing counsel can be seen on screen. Okay, perfect. Um, I'd ask that time be restarted when I ask my next question. Now, Miss Young, you were at the park five days a week for three years, correct? Yes, I was. And you witnessed a physical fight between the defendant and the victim in the summer of 2017, correct? Um, I wouldn't classify it as a physical fight, but they did have an argument. Right, it wasn't a physical fight because the defendant was the one who was attacking the victim, correct? Um, not attacking, no. The defendant threw a vase at the victim's head, right? Oh yeah, one of her elephant vases, she did get angry, very angry, and she threw a small elephant vase. When the defendant got very angry, in your own words, and threw that vase at the victim's head, it smashed on the wall behind him. Isn't that right? Yes, it did. Now, to your knowledge, the defendant had no income of her own? Um, to my knowledge, the only income she had was whatever was given from the elephant park. It's true that what Ms. Bassett told you was that the only money that she got was what the, was what the victim allowed her to have, correct? Yes. Now, I'm gonna ask you to turn in your digital notebook to exhibit 36. Do you know what this is? Yes, I do. What is this? Um, this is one of the videos that I took of Miss Bassett. 
Is it fair and accurate from the last time that you saw it? Yes, this is the video that I took. Your Honor, move to enter Exhibit 36 into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, the defense objects to this document being improper character evidence, seeing as though they're going to use this video to try to prove the character of my client. How so? They're going to use this video to show that because she acted one way in a certain situation, that she would be more likely to act the same way in another situation. Right, right. But what is what is the action that they're using to prove conformity there with? They're using this to show that, um, uh, excuse me, excuse me for a second. They're going to use this document to show that Miss uh, Bassett was angry towards uh, Don Clark during the time, uh, during before his disappearance, to try to show that she would be more likely to have harmed him. Okay. Counsel, are you using this to prove that it's more likely on another occasion she did a video confessional and said that she was angry at the victim? Yes, Your Honor. However, this falls under an exception. Okay. What is it? 404B2. This goes to show intent. All right, I think so too. Uh, overall. Yes, Your Honor. To clarify, Exhibit 36 has now been entered into evidence? Yes. Your Honor, permission for Ms. Grosso to play this video for the jury? Whenever you'd like. Oh, I'm steaming. This is a business, not a charity. As long as it's my money, we'll run it that way. That's what Don said to me. Can you believe that? We'll see how this ends. Now, Ms. Young, I'm going to ask you again to turn your digital notebook to Exhibit 38. Okay. Do you recognize this? Yes, this is another video confessional that I recorded of Ms. Bassett. Is it fair and accurate from the last time that you saw it? Yes. Your Honor, move to enter Exhibit 38 into evidence. Any objection? Uh, no objections, Your Honor. So moved. People look at me and they think I'm sweet and nice. Go on, keep underestimating me. I will lobby senators. I will protest big businesses. I will get in your face. I will take people to their grave if I have to. I will do anything to protect these elephants. Thank you, Your Honor, I have nothing further. Thank you, counsel. Uh, may Ms. Young be excused, or do we have any uh, redirect examination? Uh, no need for redirect. All right, thank you. Ms. Young, you may be excused. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, counsel, do you have anything further before you close your case in chief? No, Your Honor, the defense rests. All right, the defense having rested their case in chief will proceed to closing arguments. I'll remind the judges at this point to switch over to speaker view and for each of the council to make sure that their videos are muted while the other council is giving their arguments. Whenever you're ready to proceed. She needed control, so she took it. August 18th, 2017. It's a normal day for Don Clark. He's going about his daily business at the elephant park, which he owns. Then when his work is done, he heads back home. I'm waiting there is the defendant with an elephant tranquilizer ready to kill. As soon as he gets home, she stabs him with that tranquilizer and kills him on sight. And in that moment, she finally got what she'd always wanted, control. But we have charged the defendant, Kara Bassett, with first degree murder. We had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant murdered Don Clark with malice of forethought. Today, we've simply done just that. Now it begins in 2017, May 1st. The defendant insists on including a disappearance clause in Mr. Clark's power of attorney. This means if Mr. Clark were to go missing, die, or disappear, 
the defendant would control everything. June 17th, 2017. The victim files a restraining order against the defendant. He says, please help me. She's going to kill me in my sleep. Those are his words. He was afraid in his own home, so he filed a restraining order against his wife. On August 18th, 2017, the defendant follows up on that promise and kills Don Clark. Now what you're seeing on the screen is a timeline that Agent Branham used on the stand detailing the defendant's every move on the night Mr. Clark went missing. Now there's no question that the defendant murdered her husband that night. The defendant and the victim were the only ones at the park that night. That means the defendant was the only one with the opportunity to kill her husband. We know that Mr. Clark's hair was found in the back of the company van. Why? Because that's where the defendant left his dead body when she drove 200 miles to the Big Gum Swamp. She tried to make it seem like an accident so that she could get her money, so that she could get control. But members of the jury, this was no accident. This was murder. Now, in order to convict the defendant, we must have proved that she killed her husband with malice of forethought. When the FBI asked her about carfentanil, she laughed and said, you wouldn't need to waste a whole syringe to kill a man. And members of the jury, let's listen to her words. Let's listen to what she said today. People look at me and they think I'm sweet and nice. Go on, keep underestimating me. I will lobby senators. I will protest big businesses. I will get in your face. I will take people to their grave if I have to. I will do anything to protect these elephants. Oh, I'm steaming. This is a business, not a charity. As long as it's my money, we'll run it that way. That's what Don said to me. Can you believe that? We'll see how this ends. Members of the jury, throughout today's trial, we saw how it ended with the defendant murdering her husband. Now you've heard a lot today about the Big Gum Swamp. Most importantly, how the algae from the van perfectly matched the algae from the wheelchair, which perfectly matched algae on the defendant's boots which perfectly matched algae from the swamp. The algae on the defendant's boots matches the algae at the swamp. Now opposing counsel is trying to say, well, where's the body? We don't know where he is. We don't even know if he's dead. Members of the jury, if you want to know where John Clark is, he's at the bottom of the Big Gum Swamp. You heard today how the Big Gum Swamp is 13,000 acres. Now, more simply, that's 20 square miles. Agent Branham told you how it can be dangerous at night. There's no possible way that Agent Branham and his team could have searched every square inch. He told you that it was boggy. He told you that it was dense. Members of the jury, to put 20 square miles into perspective, that's one-tenth the size of Rhode Island. We have proven our case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant murdered Dawn Clark for the one thing she didn't have. She needed control, so she took it. Members of the jury, find her guilty. Thank you, counsel, and whenever you're ready to proceed from the defense. Yes, Your Honor, if you allow me to uh, restation my camera once again. No problem. Mm -hmm. 
May it please the court. Unreliable, unreasonable, uncertain. Members of the jury, those three words describe exactly what you just heard from Ms. Volkatich. Now, what Ms. Volkatich did was provide you evidence of an unreliable investigation conducted by the FBI, an unreasonable case built against Kara Bassett, and uncertain evidence that Donald Clark was even murdered. At the beginning of this trial, I told you that those three words would tell you and would describe to you exactly what you would hear throughout the duration of this trial. And as you listen to the trial of Kara Bassett, we are certain that you are left with more questions than answers. Members of the jury, the prosecution bears the burden of proof. They had to prove to you that my client killed her husband, Don Clark, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt isn't just a strong belief or a likeliness or a probability. This is not a civil trial. It's higher than any of those words. Beyond a reasonable doubt is a near definiteness. And we are confident that the prosecution did not leave you with a near definite feeling because all they did was provide you evidence of an unreliable investigation conducted by the FBI, an unreasonable case built by the government, and uncertain evidence that Don Clark was even murdered. First, unreliable. You heard from Joe Young's testimony about how the FBI mishandled key evidence, how they failed to question multiple witnesses. You, how do we know that the FBI didn't tamper with any other evidence in this investigation? We don't, because they continued to keep doing their unreliable investigation. Now, how do we know that a murder even took place? We don't know that either. The FBI doesn't have a body, blood, signs of foul play, or even a murder weapon. The FBI can't provide you with DNA evidence or even phone call records that place my client at the scene of the crime because there are none. According to the phone call records, my client didn't leave her house that day. Now, the FBI also, did, also found algae from my client's boots, a wheelchair, and a van. But how do we know that the algae at Big Gum Swamp didn't also grab the greater Tallahassee outfit? We don't know that either because the FBI didn't test algae from anywhere else. They also didn't investigate Don Clark's ex-wife, Lisa Clark. Now, Ms. Clark has motive. She was angry at Don and she was chasing him during the days of his disappearance. Could Lisa Clark have killed Don Clark? We don't know that either because she couldn't provide an alibi because the FBI continued their unreliable investigation and they failed to investigate her. We know that my client did have an alibi though. Second, unreasonable. The FBI will try to have you believe that my client killed her husband in order to turn Elfin Park into Elfin Sanctuary and that she didn't care about her husband going missing. Now, Members of the jury, we showed you evidence that put doubt into that entire narrative. You heard how Kara Bassett was fully cooperative with the FBI's entire investigation. You also heard how she was the one who told the FBI where the Cessna airplane was and where that Chevrolet Express van was parked because she wanted to find her husband. That's a fact that the prosecution left out. They didn't tell you that Ms. Bassett went out of her own way to go search for her husband. Joe Young also attested to how devastated Kara Bassett was during the time of her husband's disappearance. He also told you about his trip to Costa Rica, about her trip to Costa Rica, where she found evidence that Don Clark may still be living there to this day. Isn't it possible that Don Clark could have used his millions of dollars to travel to Costa Rica? Maybe, but we don't know. 
the prosecution let that out of their case because it didn't fit their false narrative. Third, and most importantly, uncertain. The prosecution can't even be certain that John Clark was even murdered. As I said before, we showed you evidence that puts doubt into that entire narrative. Sure, Kara Bass and Don Clark argued at times, but my client can't be found guilty for murder just because of some premarital arguments. Joe Young talked to Kara Bassett and Don Clark the day that, they, that he disappeared, and he testified to Kara Bassett being perfectly fine that day. But Don Clark, on the other hand, was not. She said that she talked to Don Clark just a few hours before his disappearance. And she told you that he was scared and nervous about a text that he received from Costa Rica, saying that he had to deal with it before all the blood rushing from his face. Now, we also know that Don Clark spoke to that person from the other line for 52 minutes. Who was the person that Don Clark was talking to for that long? We don't know, but the FBI doesn't know that either. Members of the jury, it should be clear to you. The prosecution failed to meet their burden. They had the burden of proof in today's case. They had to prove that my client killed her husband beyond a reasonable doubt. And the United States my client enjoys a presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Members of the jury, the prosecution did not prove my client to be guilty today. What they did was provide you evidence of an unreliable investigation conducted by the FBI. An unreasonable case built by the government against Kara Bassett. And uncertain evidence that Don Clark was even murdered. Members of the jury, Find my client not guilty. Thank you. Rebuttal, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. And yes, whenever you're ready to proceed. This case is reliable. This case is reasonable and this case is certain. The defendant is the only one who had the means, motive, and opportunity to kill the victim. The defendant's fingerprints were the ones found inside the van. The defendant's boots had algae from the swamp. The defendant requested on adding a disappearance clause. The defendant is the one who threatened to kill the victim. The defendant is the one who stood to control eight million dollars in the event of the victim's disappearance. Just think about that for a second, members of the jury. Eight million dollars, eight million reasons to kill her husband. Who benefited most from Mr. Clark's death? The defendant. She killed for control. She needed control, so she took it. Members of the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And I think that brings us to an end. Um, if the scoring judges could get their ballots in as soon as possible, I will wait on an all clear from tab to let us know when we can give some brief comments and then uh, let the kids take a break before the next round. 